it took a while for me to come to the appreciation, and this is partly thanks to Chris, of the importance of computation in the way that we think about all aspects of the brain. You know, we talk a lot about diversity in our field. And, you know, I think that there's a type of diversity which sometimes gets less attention, which is intellectual diversity. And I just think that the diversity of viewpoints which neuroscientists bring into machine learning, it's like a kind of intellectual stirring of the pot. That in and of itself carries enormous intrinsic value. There's no common ground for everyone to agree on what what constitutes artificial general intelligence, for example. Um, and I think for cognitive scientists, in, in some ways it's a little bit easier because what we want to do is not necessarily define an all-encompassing notion of intelligence, but try to isolate some aspects of human intelligence that we think are important without claiming that those are that those constitute the entirety of intelligence and then try to build machines that match those abilities. What we're doing in cognitive science, in computational neuroscience, is basically to try to come up with like good new ideas that might be seeds, that might be you know, planted and might scale. Not all of them are going to scale, right? But they're just interesting principles about how information processing systems work that give us the nugget of an insight that might one day be translated into something bigger and more powerful. This is Brain Inspired. Artificial intelligence continues to contribute to neuroscience, but does neuroscience have anything really to offer AI moving forward? That's the main topic this episode. Hi, everyone. I'm Paul. Today, I bring you Chris Summerfield and Sam Gershman, who've known each other a long time, and they have slightly different but overlapping uh, answers and viewpoints regarding that question. Chris runs his Human Information Processing Lab at the University of Oxford, where they focus on the computational underpinnings of how we learn and make decisions about what we're perceiving and what actions to take. And he also works at DeepMind. And this is the second time Sam has been on. Uh, he was on episode 28 back in the day. He runs his computational cognitive neuroscience lab at Harvard, uh, where they focus on the computational underpinnings of how we learn and represent our environments. So we have a wide-ranging discussion today that begins with and circles around the relationship between neuroscience and AI and how neuroscience has or hasn't and will or won't influence the AI world. And along the way, we dip into topics like the merits of prediction versus understanding, uh, the centrality of humans in specifying the problems that we want AI to solve, and what that means for the kind of AI that we are building, how artificial general intelligence uh, and or you know, human level AI fits into that story, and plenty more. There's also a guest question today from Andrew Sachs, who's been on the podcast before, where we discussed uh, some deep learning theory issues. He's also one of the co-authors uh, with Chris on a recent opinion piece titled, If Deep Learning is the Answer, What is the Question? Uh, which, of course, I link to in the show notes with the other stuff at braininspired.co slash podcast slash 95. Just a reminder, if you support the show on Patreon, uh, I've started a Discord community that's slowly becoming you know, more active uh, and engaged and will likely lead to some live online gatherings in the future. So check my Patreon posts for um, how to join that. Um, and if you don't support the show on Patreon, but want to for a few dollars a month, go to the Brain Inspired website and find the red Patreon button there. So I've, I've made a few levels of support now with different bells and whistles uh, within each level. I trust you'll enjoy Chris and Sam today. The discussion centers on what this podcast is all about. Enjoy. So, Chris, I was I was reconnecting with Sam a little while ago, and uh, I had I reinvited him uh, back on the show because he's been on the podcast before, and I offered to have him, you know, invite someone and and pick a topic of his choosing, and and maybe invite someone to dialogue, and I I suggested he invite someone intellectually inferior, and uh, like right <laughs> before I even finished the sentence, he said Chris Summerfield. So anyway, thanks for coming so on. That's prophetic on your part. Eh? 
So you guys knew each other at Columbia in the mid or early 2000s, correct? That's right. That's correct. What was, how did you guys know each other? And what I really want to know is, you know, what was going on at that point in your minds and in your perspectives and outlooks and how those have changed uh, oh, since then? Well, I mean, I, I remember sitting wedged between two graduate students' desks. One was Chris and one was Emily Stern. And they had put a little plank of wood connecting the two desks where I could place my computer there. Uh, and then I would just, I would be trying to work, but really I was mostly listening to them banter with each other. Uh, you were an undergraduate, right? I was an undergraduate. That's right. So I was just completely um, swept away by the experience of uh, graduate school. I thought that would seem to be the the, the most fun thing that you could be doing with your time and actually was kind of catastrophic for my undergraduate career because I completely lost interest in classes and wanted to just come to the lab all the time. I, I, I remember the time time well. Yeah, so the banter with Emily goes on to this day. Um, but uh, I mean, I think it was an interesting time also um, to be a graduate student as well because it was sort of like, it's kind of like the wild, it was like the wild west of neuroimaging at the time. Oh, yeah. So... 2000 and must have been 2003, 2004. And I think the field was still at a stage where, you know, you could sort of take any task off the shelf and put someone in the scanner and like, you know, whatever you found was a result of some interest, at least to that community. And, you, you know, you asked about how things have changed. I mean, it's interesting, you know, both, I think probably the way, what, what Sam and I both find interesting in our work right now is probably just as different as it could possibly be to what the field, where the field was at at that time. Um, in the sense that, you know, at that time there was very little focus on, on mechanism and there was, there was very little concern given to how whatever you measured at the neural level might actually tap into, you know, what was going on, the underlying mechanics. And I think it's very different now. How, how have your interests changed? So, so Chris, you said that the the interests of the field were different than than your interests now. Um, how have your interests? You know, what were your what was your big question back then, and how has it changed? Well, I was I was working. I mean, the lab where Sam and I were were both working was it was Jennifer Mangel's lab. It was a memory research lab, cognitive neuroscience uh, memory lab. And after having done my PhD there, I I think that, you know, I was kind of disenchanted with the idea that the end point of science was kind of to identify these sort of data features and just to write stories about, you know, the existence of these data features as a scientific result. And I wanted to I wanted to do something that made much tighter links to, you know, how the system worked. And at the time I felt like the only way that I could do that was to go and work in what was then kind of the most, you know, I, I, I guess like the, the, the domain that has the sort of simplest mapping from, um, stimulus to theory, um, or, or I guess, yeah, experiment to theory, which was to work in psychophysics or perceptual decision making as it became known around that time. And, you know, it's interesting that that, that move in that, in making that move, I kind of shed, you know, all of this sort of stuff about cognition and, mm. and memory and so on. But I think that the field has, the field has, has in a way, it's sort of come full circle. And I think that what's going on now is that there is a lot more, um, traction, um, computationally on those, those more topics of, of, um, of cognitive interest. I mean, that's not to say that we didn't have good cognitive theories around the time. But I think those theories are, are now much more joined up with with neuroscience, and so for me personally, you know, it feels like coming back to cognition as a really important domain of study. And all the things that we thought were just simple psychophysics turn out to be impinged upon by various cognitive processes like beliefs and memory and so on. And Sam, so how how was your perspective changed? I mean, you you had already been. I, I was just looking back at your uh, neuro tree for you, Sam, and if, you know, for both of you, but, but man, you were a research assist assistant in like three different labs as an undergrad. It, it looks mm -hmm. like as an undergrad, I mean, you have this, uh, you've had a lot of variation in your upbringing in, in your, the trajectory, I suppose. Uh, it seems like you've always been interested in, in all of this stuff, but did you have this kind of wild eyed view? How has your perspective and interests and outlook 
changed? Well, I think like many people as an undergrad, I just didn't really know enough or understand enough to know what was connected to what or <laughs> what was not connected to what. And um, so everything sort of seemed interesting and connected but I mean, it is, I was really just kind of confused and bouncing around and following my nose towards whatever was interesting. So I had started off doing stuff on, on memory, but I got interested at some point in, um, emotion and later in decision making and reinforcing learning. After I left Columbia, I went and worked uh, at NYU for a while, uh, in Nathaniel Dawes lab, but, uh, I, I think my my perspective has changed a lot in the sense that I didn't really have much of a perspective when I was an undergrad. I was just trying mm -hmm. to do things that seemed interesting to me, and I think it, it was it took a while for me to come to the appreciate appreciation. And this is partly thanks to Chris of the importance of computation in the way that we think about all aspects of the brain. I, I guess, I don't know if this is true, Chris, that at the time that I met you, I think you were undergoing a similar kind of conversion experience. And, and so that, so like, but, but the problem was that at Columbia at that time, there weren't really people doing this kinds of, uh, this kind of thing. I mean, there were, there were computational neuroscientists at the medical school as there still are, but in the psychology department, which is where we were, there wasn't a lot of that. And so I was just kind of picking things up as I went along. That's, that's absolutely right. So Columbia was a, in a way, I mean, it was a, it was a wonderful place to be a graduate student, but in a way it was also a slightly strange place because I think there's a policy particularly of, of, of maintaining, you know, incredible diversity in the research, research interests and approaches of the faculty there, meaning that, you know, you, you have lots and lots of different uh, topics being addressed, but you don't have a critical mass in any one topic. And there certainly wasn't a critical na mass in cognition or, or in, in, in cognitive and computational neuroscience, which is, I guess, you know, sort of where both our work has ended up. Chris, I mean, we, we, don't, we won't perseverate on this for too much longer, but uh, Sam mentioned that there was, his experience was one, at least partially, of a sort of mentor-mentee relationship. And uh, I remember, you know, being a graduate student and, you know, interacting with undergrads, even being a postdoc and interacting with graduate students. And I always knew in the back of my head that it, that's what the relationship was, mentor-mentee, but it didn't feel that way. Did it, did it feel that way? Uh, were you mentoring uh, Sam? Did you, were you conscious of that? Are you kidding? It was almost the, it was the opposite way around, I think. And it's, it's remained that ever since. <laughs> no, I mean, I actually think to this day, I, I, I continue to feel how important it is to, um, nurture undergrads because I just benefited so much, um, from just, I don't even know if nurturing is the right word. It's just being able to hang out around graduate students and, uh, sponge up what they're doing even though they're only just marginally less confused than I, I was, but I didn't realize it at the time. Um, they uh, marginally less confused, but, but, uh, slightly more than marginally more miserable sometimes. <laughs> well, perhaps. that was the other thing that I found jarring was that I remember going to dinner, um, at one point to, uh, uh, a graduate student's house when I was still an undergrad and all the grad students were really griping about, uh, their <laughs> lives and their careers. And, I just couldn't understand it because it just seemed so glamorous to be a graduate student from where I was sitting, which is like, I couldn't go to a class without falling asleep. Um, and I just, I just wanted to be where the action was. Um, but now, now I understand a little bit are the difficulties of being a grad student. All right, guys. Very good. Well, so the, 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 I guess the main topic that we can just, uh, dance around here, uh, that, that Sam mentioned that maybe you guys had different perspectives on, how valuable neuroscience is to AI. Uh, and, you know, the, the overarching picture, I suppose, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that uh, Sam thinks that neuroscience hasn't contributed much to AI and or doesn't have as much to contribute to AI as AI has to contribute to neuroscience. And he believes, Chris, that uh, you, you know, believe the opposite, as you've written about plenty as and, and spoken about. Um, and I know it's more subtle than that, but so, I, so I'm not sure what the best way into this discussion is, whether you each want to, you know, just make a case using, you know, an example from your own recent work, or I have some suggested, you know, topics uh, that, that, you know, can lead us into this discussion. Well, can I just clarify? I, I don't, it's not that I think that neuroscience can't contribute anything to AI. I, I certainly would very much welcome that. Uh, I just think that it's been a little bit oversold 
I think that the examples that people use uh. as evidence for that kind of claim are a little bit thin. That's my perspective. So, so I mean, there's a number of different clarifications, which I think it would be important to make sure. before we start the discussion. So the first one is about forward-looking versus backward-looking, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, obviously neuroscience, cognitive science, and AI research have kind of grown up together. And so, you know, the in the past, there obviously has been considerable mutual cross-fertilization, but whether you would want to characterize that as like, you know, ideas in AI sort of being imported wholesale from neuroscience or not, I mean, you could certainly tell that story, right? You know, you could say, oh, look, you know, we suddenly realized that a good way to do computation is to have like, you know, sheets of neurons that integrate information and transduce it non-linearly. Like, wow, that's because that's what the brain does. But, you know, of course, it's not as simple as that, right? Um, or you could make, you know, equivalent stories for reinforcement learning or for even for, for memory processes. Like if you think of, you know, the way that LSTMs do gating, right? It, looks an awful lot like our contemporary theories of, you know, activity silent states and fast synaptic plasticity and prefrontal cortex. So you can make those stories, but I think that's kind of not the most interesting way to tackle the question. And maybe if I could just... Forward-looking. Yeah, go on. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Chris, I didn't... It, it might be useful to ground this a little bit in the question, if, if I am a computer scientist trying to build AI, what should I spend my time doing? Should I spend my time basically trying to build engineering artifacts and um, fiddling with them until they do something useful? Or is it good for me to spend at least part of my time learning about biology um, and maybe even doing biology in the effort as part of an effort to uncover the mechanisms that allow the brain um, to do intelligent things? And, and, the, and, and so I, I do get plenty of people into my, coming into my office, I'm sure Chris does too, that uh, people from computer science um, and, and other engineering disciplines who want to learn about the brain precisely for this reason, because they think that by um, learning about the brain, they can uncover some secrets that they can put into their algorithms. And I, I think that that's the part that I'm kind of skeptical about. I think that certainly the idea that you could find parallels and cross currents between neuroscience and AI, that, that's, that, that's been hugely useful. Um, even if we don't worry about like the whole intellectual history of who influenced who, it's just, I think it's a, it's a matter of like, what do you hope to get out of biology as a, as an engineer? Can I just ask a cl clarification question uh, about what you mean by biology? Because, you know, for instance, you, you, you know, in your, in your paper, uh, building machines that learn and think like humans, you talk about a lot of cognitive aspects that could be, uh, could be an aid to, uh, to building AI, things like intrinsic physics, intrinsic psychology, causality, compositionality. But these are more cognitive science type psychology level type things. So when you say biology, do you just, do you mean the, the, uh, the neurons yeah, I mean the actual the biology, brain, or do you, right? Cause we're talking about neuroscience here, not about psychology. Um, yeah, but okay. Yeah. See, but I guess my definition of neuroscience is just really broad because, uh, if you narrow the neuroscience down to, because I, I, I believe that when you're doing, when you're using like deep learning models to understand the brain, you're doing neuroscience and, and you're comparing it to brain activity. That is neuroscience. Right, but that's not what we're talking about, right? We're talking about um, using neuroscience to build better AI, right? So, so I, 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 I think we we're all in agreement that AI has had a lot of, lot to, has contributed and will continue to contribute much to our understanding of the brain. It's the, sort of the other direction, which I'm more skeptical about. Does it matter, do you think, that neuroscience is still quite young and, uh, from my perspective, still has a long way to go in learning actually what the brain is doing? But, but this, is, this is exactly the issue that I'm concerned about, which is that how, wh what is the process by which we understand what the brain is doing? The, the reason why... Um, I move towards computational theories is because the computational theories provide a way of not just interpreting, but also just describing the mechanisms that we observe in the brain, right? So, so in the, the point is that we can't actually discover how the brain works unless we go in with some computational theory to interpret what we're measuring. Um, there's not, there, there's not a kind of naive empiricist pathway by which we can just look at the data and from that extract computational mechanism. Do you think people believe that there is? 
I do. I mean, I think that many neuroscientists approach the data gathering enterprise in that way that will measure a bunch of things and then see what comes out or apply kind of sophisticated statistical algorithms to extract structure from their data and then try to interpret it. But but that's not necessarily the sort of that's not necessarily the sort of knowledge that um, people are going to you know want to buy into in machine learning in order to try to build better models, right? Is it Sam? I mean, it's true that people do that. Well, wait, sorry, which kind of knowledge? Well, I mean, you know, this w- what you described is this sort of you know there there are these sort of Baconian neuroscientists out there who are just mm-hmm. into sort of you know massive data collection exercises, and of course, you know. There is an excitement around, you know, big data in neuroscience, rightly, I think. But when mm-hmm. you talk about, you know, neuroscience influencing AI research, I don't think that's what most readily springs to mind. I think when yeah. we think about neuroscience influencing AI research, we think about constraints on architectures that come from our knowledge of memory systems. We think about, you know, kind of the sorts of processes which underlie attentional selection or, or, or task level control or even language. And we think about these. Now, cl- clearly, these are not ideas from neuroscience qua neuroscience, right? These are ideas which span mm-hmm. psychology, cognitive science and, and neuroscience. But I think, I, I think there is, a, there is a, there is an argument that these things are useful for building stronger AI. But I think it really depends upon what you want your AI to do. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. what you want to do is is protein folding. I shouldn't think you need any of these things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think when we talk about AI, we're talking about doing the kinds of things that the brain does. Right. Human flexible human intelligence. Right. That, that, that That's just that's not all of AI, but that's I think that's the kind of AI that is in question here. And I think just in response to what you just said, Chris, it seems to me that there's that we have two horns of a dilemma. One is one path you can go is collect data in this sort of Baconian big data mode. Um, but until it's interpreted through the right theoretical lens, it may not be particularly useful from an engineering perspective. Um, or you can go in with a more theory driven approach, but to do that, you need to have already a computational theory in your grasp and, the problem is that if you already have the computational theory, right, then f- again, from the engineering perspective, you could just build that computational theory into your algorithms, right? You don't need, if you already have the computational theory, why do you need to go look at the biology? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I don't disagree with that at all. I mean, to my mind, neuroscience has many things to offer AI, but they're not primarily theories of how the brain works. I think they're they're primarily tools and approaches which are mature in psychology and neuroscience and which are either overlooked or immature in machine learning and AI research. So one is just like mm-hmm. a good sense of how to define the question, right? To how to define a research question. So one thing psychologists are really good at is they're really good at framing a research question and desiring and designing environments, you know, what we call, you know, experiments, but in machine learning terms, this is just an environment, right? Defining environments that are there to kind of explore that research question and try to work out how an agent is solving a particular class of problem. And that's an enormously useful tool for doing machine learning research, because if you want your engineering approaches to scale and generalize, you need to understand how they work. And what machine learning and AI researchers historically do very badly is to take the trouble to sit down and try and work out how their algorithms are solving the problems that they're solving. And, you know, there's, there's, it's not to say that nobody does that, but there's an excessive focus on whether it works relative to Mm -hmm. how it works. And I think what neuroscientists can provide are tools and approaches that can, can ameliorate that. I also just think that sociologically, you know, maybe this is a trite point, but, you know, we talk a lot about diversity in our field. And, you know, I think that there's a type of diversity, which sometimes perhaps reasonably, but it gets less attention, which is intellectual diversity. And I just think that the diversity of viewpoints, which neuroscientists bring into machine learning is sort of, you know, it's, it's like a kind of intellectual stirring of the pot. And, you know, I think that, that that in and of itself carries enormous intrinsic value. And I think that, 
it's the, exactly the same is true in the reverse direction, right? And maybe I don't know if we'll get on to talking about how neuroscience is being, uh, has been and is being shaped by, you know, what's gone on in AI research in the last sort of, you know, eight to 10 years. But in both directions, that sort of, you know, mixing it up that's come from the crossover between the fields, I think is really, really valuable. Yeah, I, I think what you're saying, Chris, resonates with me a lot. I, I, the, the thing that, just to maybe give my own reiteration of what you're saying, the the thing that neuroscience and cognitive science have contributed most, I think, to AI research is a is a different kind of workflow pattern. Because if if you think about if you think about the way in which computer scientists go about improving their their artifacts, they you have to you have to establish some benchmarks and then show that you can achieve state of the art performance on the, those benchmarks and then there's this kind of arms race to get better and better performance um but at some point people say well we need different benchmarks like this benchmark is not capturing something important and usually the the points at which that happens is when people realize um that it's sort of when pe- when when the computer scientists kind of step outside their paradigm and, and look beyond to the things that people do often um, that, 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 that people can do and their systems can't do or, or fail in weird ways, right? So, so the examples of this are like um, adversarial examples for um, computer vision systems, for example. And I think that what cognitive scientists and neuroscientists have to offer is that essentially they, they have a whole collection of the, they have a collection of different ways of, of teasing apart these, um, different kinds of, um, or let me, let me put it a different way. So they, I think that they have a methodology for looking, for constructing the kinds of tests that would reveal mechanism, right? That's what Chris was saying before. Um, and that, that is often of less interest to engineers who are trying to achieve state of the art performance because you don't necessarily need to understand why something's work something works as long as it works right it's sort of like keeping things keeping people honest right keeping the computer scientists honest about what is the what are the important things to capture yeah but also i mean if you think about even beyond beyond thinking about um yeah this keep keeping honest or whatever if you think about the the, the way in which uh, cognitive scientists and neuroscientists have have also helped define the problem, right? Define the set. Of, you know, if we're talking about like you know, kind of AI research of the kind of you know what what people call the search for general intelligence, then you know, even just defining what that means is something which I think within machine learning and AI research there's not enough attention given to, and I think in cognitive science it's something that people have thought much more deeply about, you know, posing the simple question of like, if you, if you wanted to, to develop like success criteria for building the sorts of intelligence, like if we're talking about human level machine intelligence, what what would those success criteria look like? I think that, you know, that's the sort of question that you're going to find richer and more varied answers in cognitive science, maybe not necessarily in neuroscience, but in cognitive science than you would in contemporary machine learning research, I think. That, that was going to be one of my questions to you because, um, so cognitive science has what, originally six branches, anthropology is even one of them, um, that is supposed to be included in what cognitive science is, and but philosophy is one of them. And uh, I'm wondering if if we get the definitions wrong, if we get the, the questions wrong, is that going to hinder the ability to create something like AGI? I'm not sure if that's what you're getting at, Chris, about formulating the, the questions correctly and if that's what you mean is the ph- philosophical part of cognitive science or or something else I don't, I don't even know if it needs to be a um a philosophical part right formulating a research question is an intrinsic part of the scientific endeavor right you know you think thinking about you know what, what does it mean for an agent to you know kind of display some some strong forms of generalization or to display metacognition or to you know display curiosity how do you operationalize those and how do you measure them that doesn't seem to me like a philosophical question that seems to me like a scientific question that's the sort of thing that cognitive scientists do well so yeah i think operationalization is a scientific thing so but so there's no risk you think of if we 
you know, something like metacognition, right, which I quote unquote studied and thought I knew what it meant until I studied it and realized I didn't know what it meant, you know, a lot of assumptions mm-hmm. I had about what it meant. So we operationalized it and then measured things. But I still don't know what metacognition is, even though we operationalized it, we gave it a definition, measured it and said whether the monkeys were being metacognitive, for instance. But I still really don't uh, understand what metacognition is, and I don't know if that matters. So can I give a different example, um, which might be a useful reference point for discussion? Um, you, you sometimes see computer scientists saying that a particular task was solved. So, for example, at some point, I think people started declaring Atari to be solved. Well, one operationalization of success in those games is, is can you achieve human or super, superhuman level performance with uh, enough training? Um, and then by that criterion, you could say that Atari has been solved. But if you look at it from the perspective of achieving human level sample complexity, like can you get to the asymptotic performance as quickly as humans can? Or can you generalize to, to other variants of the games uh, as quickly as humans can? Or then, then arguably Atari hasn't been solved yet. So depending on your operationalization, you're going to have different criteria for success. And to me, I think the important thing is that there's nothing within um, the framework of machine learning that tells you how to operationalize these, these the constructs of intelligence, right? And I think that's why there, there's been uh, so much back and forth about this because th- there's no common ground for everyone to agree on what what constitutes artificial general intelligence, for example. Um, and I think for cognitive scientists, maybe it, it's a different kind of, in, in some ways, it's a little bit easier because what we want to do is not necessarily define an all-encompassing notion of intelligence, but try to isolate some aspects of human intelligence that we think are important without claiming that those are, that those constitute the entirety of intelligence and then try to build machines that match those abilities. Um, and that the hope is that by studying those empirically, we can learn something about how they work uh, in the brain and that can be ported into AI. That's it. I was waiting to see if you had comment on that, Chris. I mean, go ahead if you, if you do. I, I don't know if I really do have a comment. I mean, I completely agree. Um, you know, the operationalization question, we, could, we can operationalize in terms of some sort of external benchmark like Atari, right? So nobody in the contemporary AI community invented Atari just as they didn't invent Go. So it provides an external benchmark. But of course, you know, there's a, there's a kind of, you know, there's a kind of Goodhart's law problem with these external, external benchmarks, right? Which is that, you know, people optimize for the benchmark and they don't optimize for the general functions which underlie good performance on the benchmark, right? And, you know, the trouble is that then you're into, if you say, okay, well, let's dispense with the external benchmarks, then you're into the much more slippery world where you're both making up the tests that you use to evaluate your agents and you're training the agents that are going to try and pass those tests, right? And that's obviously a much more, you know, di- it, it, it's, a, it's a much more difficult situation to, to come up with good validations of your performance because obviously you don't know whether those two process, the process of building the test and the process of training the agent are actually sort of mutually interacting in some way, which means that, you know, you're just satisfying your own demand characteristics. I think this is a real challenge for for AI research. I think it's it's also a challenge for neuroscience research, honestly. So I think that we see a similar phenomenon where, um, for example, now one approach to understanding what the ventral visual stream does is to uh, train train systems for image classification. So that typically is some kind of deep convolutional neural network. Um, and then try to quantitatively match the activity in the layers of the artificial network to the activity in the layers of, um, in the different regions of the ventral visual stream. And, um, and then the, the game becomes, how do we get those numbers, the, the numbers quantifying the match to be as high as possible? Um, and my worry about that is, is that in operationalizing success in that way, you're ignoring a lot about other aspects of vision that might not be captured by these kinds of systems. Um, so like when I talk to students about this, I, I often give them examples of all sorts of phenomena from visual cognition, which um, it's not obvious, or it, not only is it not obvious that the systems can do it, but nobody is actually trying to ascertain whether those systems do it, or, or few people are, um, because the, the way in which 
the success criteria are set up are not um, uh, designed to assess that. That's not part of the assessment. So, so I agree with that like a hundred percent. So I've written about this as well, and I mean, I th- I think that there is a, there is a real worry that you know what I see as being the central project of computational neuroscience, which is essentially to to try to understand computation is sort of being, you know, sort of slightly gleefully dispensed with in the irrational exuberance around machine learning methods. And there's a sort of sense of, well, actually, we don't have to grapple with the hard problems because we can just train neural networks and, you know, we can just, you know, find some linear mapping um, that, you know, kind of that links whatever our neural markers are with our neural network. And th- that's kind of, th- that is the story. And, it, and you know, You've, you've had guests on your podcast, I think, who advocate for this. And, and it seems to me that there's a, there's a sort of a corollary of that viewpoint, which is that, you know, actually there isn't anything really very interesting to be studied in the first place. And I, I disagree with that. And I, I suspect Sam does too. Yeah. But I, I guess I, I, I think that we shouldn't summarily dismiss the kind of radical challenge to scientific understanding that's posed by these kinds of approaches, which I think, I think, I think we should, we should address. And, and I'll come back to why I think it doesn't quite work. But, um, I was very struck actually once talking to a, a geologist who told me that he felt that, the, the, um, gener- multiple generations of geophysicists were ruined by their classical education because the textbooks have various kinds of mathematical models and principles. Um, but if you actually try to use those to, for example, predict earthquakes, they just completely fail. And he was impressed. And, and I think it was a kind of earth shattering moment for him when he realized that he could train neural networks to predict earthquakes far better than all the classical theory could. And to him, the way that he interpreted that was that we shouldn't be wasting time with the classical theory um, we, we should refashion, uh, science as a kind of predictive enterprise. Cause what good are all of these scientific theories if they can't predict some of the critical things that we want uh, to use them to predict? And so it's a kind of it, eliminative approach to the scientific enterprise where we're going to get rid of our conventional notions of understanding and replace them with generic prediction. And I think that there's, there's a school of thought within neuroscience that that is, that is a viable approach. To me, the problem with this is not so much that, uh, about, so much about the, about prediction per se. I think it, I think we should strive to build models that make good predictions, quantitatively accurate predictions. The problem is, how do you know if you're successful, right? Because you have to say, this is the signal that I want to predict. And then, and then you, and then you can only declare victory once you, once you've stipulated that these are the, these are the phenomena that I'm trying to predict. And I, I had this conversation with Jim DiCarlo at some point recently where I was asking him, do, so he, you, you, you've set up the task that you want to predict as much variance as you can of, let's say, inferior temporal cortex activity. Um, now you're using population recordings, um, but it, um, what if you can measure other stuff, right? Like all of the ion channel activations in all of the neurons, right? All the extracellular contents and so on, all the intracellular contents. And he said, yes, I would want to build models that, that can predict all of that stuff, right? So the, the, so the only limiting factor there is like our ability to measure stuff. Um, and that, and the more we can measure that, that automatically gets encompassed by the, w- within the scope of the modeling inter- uh, exercise, right? Um, and, and that struck me as actually kind of surprising that he said that because it seemed to me that if your goal is to understand how a system can, for example, perform uh, image classification, you might actually be doing, a, or object recognition, you might be doing yourself a disservice because you could gain points in your score by basically just being able to capture the kinetics of ion channels without without um, actually improving your ability to predict, predict um, the aspects of the activation that are actually relevant for, for uh, uh, doing object recognition. In, in other words, like if, if your, the scope of your scientific theory is completely unbounded, then you can 
score in ways that are kind of unrelated to the thing that you're actually trying to do in the first place. Yeah. So I think there's two, I, I would, I would agree with that. And I would sort of nuance it in two ways, right? So what, what, what are our critiques of a pure, you know, this kind of pure eliminative version of science in which all we try to do is come up with a great predictive model? Well, I mean, num- number one is that, you know, there may be a future occasions in which you wish to explain particular parts of the variance in your data, which are poorly captured by your predictive model, right? So your predictive model, if you're just optimizing for a single a, a, for a single variable, right, it may well be the case that that variable is not actually very interesting. And the way that your model succeeds is by capturing all the boring stuff. And the, the link to the specific case that we're considering, which is, you know, kind of trying to explain variance in population activity in IT is that you know, if you compare the amount of variance that is explained by um, deep supervised networks that are trained versus untrained, it's actually a relatively modest improvement that you get by just training the network. And what that means is that essentially most of your variance is being explained by what's present in the stimuli in the first place, right? It's nothing to do with the network per se. So you can build good predictive models that aren't actually all that useful in the, in the, in the long run. And the second point I think is more critical, and it's like, why do we want forms of understanding which are not just blind prediction? And for me, that's because the translational opportunities which are presented by science are not just those that come with, you know, having fantastic predictive models. I mean, protein folding is a fantastic predictive model. And you can think, okay, in that particular case, all I need is a black box that's going to tell me exactly how this protein folds, and then I can, you know, cure malaria or whatever is going to be done with it. But there are manifold other cases in which we need also to have understanding for understanding's sake. And that's because the decisions which are consequent to those predictions bear upon aspects of our society, which are, you know, kind of have, have, have moral resonance or, or have consequences. So in other words, I'm talking about, you know, interpretability and, um, you know, the, we, we want to be able to understand how systems work because it's only when we understand how systems work and can explain them that we can make appropriate judgments. So in you know this context, it might be a health context, right? So you know we need to understand how things work so we can make decisions that have consequences, you know, for for patient care and not just for you know kind of uh, uh, for diagnosis and prognosis, for example. That's also assuming that humans are the right judges. Right. So why not just replace the human judgment with another black box predictive system that would, if it's so good at what it's doing, why rely on humans to, to be the arbiter? Go ahead. But, but I mean, we're, we're talking about in any design system, uh, you're designing it to do something that you want it to do. Right. And part of the problem is that we don't know exactly how to specify the, the design in the sense that like, you know, the, the, the kind of common examples are like, I, I want to build a robot that says, make as much money as you can, right? But then the robot goes and sells your dog, right? Now, you didn't, now, it's doing what, what you told it to do, right? But there is something that you didn't tell it, you didn't want it to do. Uh, and, it, and because you didn't specify it in that way, then um, something bad happened. Um, and it's very easy to go off the rails in that way, right? Like, if, if you tell the system, you know, cure malaria... What happens if it, you know, kills many thousands of people in the process, uh, and but still ultimately cures malaria? Um, so, so we can't. We, it's inescapable, right? That there's a human in in the loop for these for like socially meaningful AI. I mean, circling back to our earlier conversation, so so I, I completely agree with that. And you know, for me, in actual fact, you know, we talked about we framed this discussion around a distinction between you know general versus narrow. AI. And I actually see that distinction as being inextricably linked to precisely what Sam just highlighted, right? So for me, any sort of generally intelligent system has to be a system which is able to forge its own priorities independent of a human who, you know, kind of specifies them directly, right? A system that is able to to work out what it should do in the context of, you know, in the open-ended context of the data that it receives, rather than satisfying an objective like, you know, kind of, you know, fault proteins or win at go. Wait, Chris, how far do you how far do you take that? So, if we think about actual humans, we we spend a lot of time raising kids and kind of 
programming them to have the same value, not just the same values, but also the, the same sort of methods for, for achieving their goals. Um, and, and that's part of us inculcating the design specifications for living in human society. Uh, and it, I, I would expect the same would be true of a, of a robot, right? Like when you say they should be able to operate independently, I, I don't think you mean completely independently because they still have to kind of interact with human society in various ways. I just interject and say that d- despite our best efforts to program our children, it, it doesn't work, right? So b- because of, you know, things like, and Chris has written about, <laughs> and I was going to ask about intrinsic motivation and having something at stake um, and, you know, the reward paradox, et cetera. And how much that has to bear on on this sort of question of of the general AI aspect and and having something at stake and having your own issues and and uh, something to well intrinsic intrinsic motivation I, I suppose would be the question but uh, but Sam you're fooling yourself if you think you're pro- programming your children well <laughs> I, I didn't say I'm programming them well but I said that I think that we're underestimating how much. Um, we program our kids and how, like they couldn't f- function in human society if all they did was hoard resources for themselves and kill anyone who got in their way. Right. Like, and they, they learn because your kids are not teenagers yet. That's just... <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they, they learn skills that allow them to um, cooperate and collaborate with other people. So, so they, I mean, I, I, I agree. And I mean, you know, if you ask me, I mean, we, we, we haven't got to this point in the discussion, but you know, my my view is that I, I don't think that we will be able to build general intelligence in any recognizable form. And I think that actually, as a project, I actually don't see that as um, necessarily something which is going to be you know the most advantageous goal for humanity. I mean, I I think you know, first of all, we have a lot of humans, and you know, we probably don't want to build any more, um, or we don't need to build any more. And secondly, I think, you know, but more, more seriously, I think that, um, so much of what we think of as human intelligence comes wrapped up with our, the, our social nature, with our culture, with the things we learn from others, from our parents, from society, with the values that we have. And I think those values, we acquire them by virtue of being human ourselves. And I think it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for an agent which is not a human, which does not have human status in society, which does not have a human body, a human abilities, which is not constrained by in the same way that a human is, you know, you know, I can't like, you know, make a copy of my brain, right? But an AI system you could. So a system that is not constrained in those ways, I don't see how it could ever have the same sort of intelligence that that we do. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't be able to build very powerful systems. But I think the goal of sort of seeking to emulate a human is a little bit naive, perhaps. This obviously intersects with questions of value alignment. But yeah, right. So I mean, you're, you're saying that we may not value it as a species anyway. That, that we would derive more value from a bunch of narrow AI than a human-like general AI. Is am I reading you correctly? I mean, it's something in between, right? Or sorry, Chris, you should answer the question. Yeah. I- I, I mean, I, I'm not saying that we shouldn't try to build stronger AI than we have right now. And, you know, I share completely all the, you know, the, the things that Sam has highlighted, right? You know, which is that, you know, the, the, the machine learning solutions that we have right now tend to be, they're not very robust and, you know, they're limited in their applicability and so on. I think we can do better. But I think that, you know, kind of a sort of naive imagining of the end point of this research as being something which is, you know, sort of, walks and talks a li- little bit like us, except kind of better, <laughs> is misguided at best and, you know, <laughs> dangerous at worst. I, I think if you look at how AI is portrayed in science fiction movies and literature, that's the kind of thing that I think most people have in mind when they talk about AGI, right? It's something, it's like very capable assistance for humans, right? And I think what people sometimes forget is that there's a big difference between very capable assistance for humans and humans because we don't necessarily want AI systems that have all the same values as us because um, those systems are going to expect the same privileges as us. They're going to expect the same to be able to live the same lives as us. Right. Um, And um, we don't want to be in the business of like enslaving other humans. Right. So the minute that they really 
achieve that kind of humanity, then th- that's going to be the point at which the artificial assistant era is kind of over, right? Unless you're willing to start a new era of slave machine slavery. So I, I think that our goals should be to create good, int- strong AI systems that can help us do things that we care about and not worry too much about perfectly emulating the human brain. Right. So to bring some of these strands, I mean, the conversations sort of gone in two different directions, but to to bring these strands together, I mean, I guess for me, what links these two topics is that in science, we need understanding for understanding's sake. And for me, at least, you know, having, you know, great predictive models is not the sole objective of, of science. And, you know, when we're thinking about AI, you know, understanding additionally furnishes us with an opportunity to not only build powerful systems, but to to understand how those systems achieve the goals that they are set, and thus to to have you know to be able to exert more control over them to behave in ways that we find to be acceptable, right? The value alignment problem, um, you know, bypassing some of the potential externalities which will inevitably ensue from just sort of rampant, you know, kind of optimization of powerful agents. Okay, guys, so I'm going to throw a wrench in this real quick, because just for the in the interest of time, so we, we were going to talk and, and we may still talk about and frame some of these questions uh, about how neuroscience can inform AI and how AI has and can inform neuroscience. Uh, we were going to discuss Chris's uh, recent paper, If Deep Learning is the Answer, What's the Question? Well, one of the co-authors on that paper is Andrew Sachs, and I enlisted him to uh, ask a question. I'll just play the question, and I'm sorry if it's kind of an you know orthogonal, perhaps, but uh, I'm sure it'll we can bring it all back together. So, so here's the question, and Sam, this is you know you can take this for you as well. Hi, Chris. Uh, it was an absolute pleasure writing this paper with you, and I feel like we see eye to eye on so many things that yeah, it's just always wonderful to collaborate with someone where you feel like each person really gets where the other is coming from. That sort of makes it hard for me to ask an intriguing question, but but here's my attempt. In rereading this paper, we defend the idea that it's worth trying to understand these models. And yet, I was reflecting on DeepMind's accomplishments, and one of the features they seem to prize quite greatly in their systems is that their systems teach them something that the designers didn't know. In AlphaGo, it discovered new moves in Go that were considered beautiful and certainly beyond anything the designers knew. And uh, in AlphaFold, we've learned something that there's no question no human has access to. And my question to you is, have we underappreciated the value of that type of scientific discovery? Are those opportunities waiting for us in neuroscience? where one of these complex models delivers fundamentally creative new knowledge that humans can then go back and reinterpret. Okay, so it wasn't quite orthogonal, it turns out. But <laughs> but there you go. There's, thanks, Andrew, for the question. I mean, the question seems very related to the discussion that we were just having. Yep. Um, so I guess my answer would be the same. So, you know, if we focus on, the, on AlphaGo, I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's certainly true that, you know, in a way, the system is endowed with knowledge, which we do not have in the sense that it can beat any of us convincingly at that game. But to what extent that actually feeds back and provides us with new knowledge, I think it's kind of debatable, right? I mean, when AlphaGo came out, I remember having a discussion with colleagues at DeepMind about what would constitute an explanation from AlphaGo of a particular move that it made. And I think I, I should probably credit Neil Rabinovitz with this insight. And um, he said that, you know, well, on, on the one hand, you can think of sort of two extremes of explanation, which AlphaGo might give for one of its moves. So on the one hand, it might say, well, you know, I made this move because, you know, parameter one was set to this value, parameter two was set to this value, parameter three, all the way up to, you know, however many million of parameters it had. Um, and that would be one answer, which would be basically useless to us. Alternatively, you know, it could say, if you asked it why it made that move, it could say, well, because, because I wanted to win. And that answer would also be useless to us. Right? And 
I think that it's actually a really non-trivial problem to back out what might constitute genu genuine interpretable knowledge, even from these powerful systems. I mean, the case of AlphaFold is a bit different because with the blind prediction, we don't understand necessarily how Alpha, exactly how AlphaFold is making those predictions. But because we know it does so accuracy, we can, accurately, we can go on and do incredible things. And that's really, really amazing. But I'm not actually sure that I agree with the central premise that we get that kind of interpretable knowledge for free out of these powerful agents. Yeah, just just to echo uh, what Chris is saying, I, I actually think that there's there's two ways to interpret what Andrew is saying here. Um, one is a kind of less radical interpretation, which is essentially that these kinds of systems are tools for discovering things um, in a similar way that, a, let's say, a telescope was a tool for Galileo being able to see things that he couldn't see with his naked eye, right? So there were sort of cognitive and perceptual limitations that, you know, in, let's say, the combinatorial space of um, Go or in pr protein folding, we just can't evaluate all the different possibilities. So if we have a really powerful tool for efficiently searching the combinatorial space, then we can discover things that when presented to us, we can using our own brains, interpret the meaning of those discoveries, right? So it's discovery in the sense that, uh, in the sense of a kind of um, measurement tool or prosthetic, rather than uh, a more radical notion of discovery, which is that the machine itself uh, teaches us how to understand what it's doing, right? And I think that's what, what Chris is talking about here. And I think this is, this is, um, goes back actually, Paul, to what you're saying about metacognition and what it means, because if you take something like AlphaGo, AlphaGo is trained to win Go, right? It's not trained to explain Go to people, right? Um, now, you could try to build machines that do that, right? And, and I think it raises the question, why would you want to do that? And for me, the reason why you'd want it to do, want to do that, and this is essentially the problem of building interpretable AI systems, is that the systems, when we design narrow specifications for what we want our systems to do, that's useful and, and kind of convenient because we know how to do that, right? We know how to tell a computer system how to play Go, right? That doesn't mean it's easy to build a, a system that actually wins uh, Go, but um, uh, it's easy to define the goal of, of the system. But when we say that we want a system to generalize in a flexible way, it's actually not at all clear what we mean by generalize flexibly because we don't, we haven't defined this, the, the scope of uh, flexible generalization. In other words, we don't know what is the set of things that we ge want to generalize over. And, and you can see this in a, a lot of discussion about, about uh, invariance in AI, right? So a lot of groups are interested in building invariance into their systems. And everyone kind of agrees on intuitive examples, like if you have a representation of an object, then if it should be invariant to certain kinds of tra uh, transformations, like if you move it around or make it bigger or smaller. But in essence, all of the, all of the definitions of invariance, all the specific definitions of invariance require some human to say, this is what I want my system to be invariant to. There's no way for the system to autonomously, um, come up with what invariances it wants or uh, except, well, I should uh, qualify that by saying that there are people trying to build systems that can discover invariances. And that I think that's an extremely interesting work uh, line of research, but it raises the kind of puzzle, which is that how do you know whether it's learning the right kind of invariances without humans being able to inspect the invariances it learns to say, yes, that's a good invariance and no, that's a bad invariance. Um, and that's why we need interpretability because we need to, we need um, to, we need to be able to verify that our system is doing the thing that we want. I'm so glad you raised this issue. So this is something that I, you know, I feel very strongly about. And I think that it's something that is often, you know, deeply overlooked. You know, I was just reading papers today um, in which, you know, the kind of in the introduction section, we've all read these papers. There's kind of like, you know, it starts off by saying humans are great at generalizing and like we were building machine learning systems, but they don't do transfer learning or, you know, out of distribution inference nearly as well as humans and like well how can we fix that right but of course you know there's a there's a there's a sort of hidden anthropocentrism in that statement right which is the assumption that the way that humans generalize is like the correct way to do it 
And so, you know, there's a well-known example, which Gary Marcus is fond of illustrate, using to illustrate failures of generalization, which is where you have a network which should, in theory, learn an identity mapping between, you know, kind of binary from binary inputs to binary outputs. And, you know, you can show that if you try to do that in a few sample way, then it fails on that, that problem. And I think what's not often um, discussed is the fact that implicit in that claim is the idea that the identity function is like the right thing to do. So fundamentally, when you want to talk about good generalization, you're making an, you're making an ontological claim. You're making a claim about how the world is and thus what the generalization conditions which we want should be. And the thing is that, you know, going back to what we were just discussing, how the world is, is always see, seen through the lens of our values as humans, right? The world is as it is to us because of our human nature and because of our, you know, the, our, our shared beliefs and our shared customs and our shared values across society. And I think that you can't escape from that. And I think that that human element, because Machine learning is born of statistics and computer science and these disciplines which have sort of elided the human aspect. There's a failure to recognize that fundamentally, actually, these deep research questions are fundamentally questions about the world and specifically about the human world. Do you think that, uh, so for me personally, just viewing it, I feel like one of the things that machine learning and AI uh, has taught us is just how uh, poor we are at doing things and how limited our abilities are and and really how uh, you know like like you just said in introductory papers we're the most general thing ever but really we're not very good at generalizing ourselves and we have all these constraints and limitations and I feel like AI has actually highlighted that and I'm wondering if you guys feel the same so AI has taught us about us in that respect it's a hard question Sam do you I want to know what you want to get <laughs> I want to know what you're going to say before I try to answer the question. Uh, well, it's a hard question in part because I could agree with it depending or not depending on what exactly you mean. I mean, there's certainly lots of ways in which we generalize very effectively that we don't know how to build AI systems to generalize in that way. But I mean, I mean, what, what kind of failures are you thinking of? Oh, I don't have a specific example yeah. in mind, unfortunately. But uh, I just think in a in a general sense... You know, so AI can um, do very specific things very well using a very particular network, you know, a deep learning network, for instance. And uh, we may be extremely bad at doing that. And that's a very, that's a specialized example. I'm not, I'm, you know, we transfer learn much better than AI does, for instance. But I, I think it has pointed out that we're not so good at a lot of things that we think we're good at, I think was my main, uh, my main point. Right. But I think I, oh, okay. I think I understand what you're saying. Like we could say, we think we're really good at playing Go, but actually we're not that good at it because you can build machines that do way better at us. And we thought we were good because we're such generalized abstract thinkers, for instance. And and that's not the way to play Go, for instance, unless that's what the, the deep learning network is doing. Well, I, I'm not sure about that claim, right? I, I don't know if anyone has claimed that the reason we're good at Go is because we're such generalists. Um, I think actually to be really good at Go, you have to be single-mindedly obsessed at it. I mean, that I think that's true of any kind of expertise in a particular domain. But not if you listen, well, and I only know this for chess, not if, if you listen right. to the experts at chess, they're at least not aware of playing out all the scenarios, right? They're only aware of like the heuristics of the board and uh, the way the board is set up. And they don't think six moves ahead. They think, uh, I've been here before and this is what needs to happen because I can kind of see it. Right. Right. But that, I'm not, I'm not making a claim about the, the specific mechanisms by which experts achieve success at these games. I'm just saying that, um, if you believe some of the theories about, um, chess expertise, I don't know about Go expertise, but I could imagine that it's similar. You know, for example, Herb Simon, um, did quite a bit of research on chess expertise. And the claim was that, um, they are building up this massive data. Grandmasters, for example, are building up this massive database of patterns that they can refer right, to right. Um, and determine their moves. I, I almost feel like it's the op you could make the opposite claim, right? Which is that that machine learning has sort of swallowed in a kind of unexamined fashion the notion that humans are really, really good at generalizing. Because you know the sorts of behaviors, I guess, that we would like our agents to be able to to engage in. Maybe there are things like you know. 
we want them to be able to solve complex math problems or we want them to be able to do science or we want them to be able to you know do means end reasoning to solve climate change or this kind of things and we recognize that these things are really hard and these are things that humans are actively engaged at and you know given enough time and and resources might be able to do right but i think that you know, the real problem with that statement is and this is you know covid obviously relates to things that that sam has said before but it, it sam and others have said before but it The real problem with the statement is that it overlooks the extent to which that ability, ability to reason abstractly is is like heavily grounded yeah. in yeah. the training that we have and the sharing of information that we have. You know, of course, I, I can do multiplication. I'm not very good at maths, by the way, but, I can, you know, I, I can probably compute mm -hmm. simple polynomials, but like, you know, I can only do that because someone taught me how to do it, right? And... That we we forget, I think, you know, that when we are trying to train agents, we forget that our ability to 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 solve complex problems and to reason abstractly that we we forget about the extent to which that comes only through you know a really really um, careful nurturing of our understanding in an educational or a curriculum setting. Um, and through the sharing of uh, with other people, and you know, I think in a way there's a sort of naive um, motivation in a lot of p papers in machine learning that focus on transfer learning, which is like, oh, you know, humans, you know, you, it's like as if you take you know baby Jim and sort of just give him a lot of data, and then you know because he, because there's something magical in his brain, then suddenly you know he can like understand quantum physics, and it's I think you know by trial and error, and I think it's just not like that. Yeah, I mean, this is, if you look in the cognitive psychology literature at the studies of analogical reasoning, which I think are maybe paradigmatic of the, the, what we'd like AI systems to do in terms of flexible generalization, actually, humans are quite frequently quite dismal at that. Um, and you have to do a lot of cajoling to get people to recognize analogies, uh, at least in certain circumstances. Um, so I, I think, but part, and part of that, as, as Chris is saying, is that in order to recognize analogies, you need a lot of content knowledge in the different domains in order to be able to map between them. Um, that That's kind of the logic of, of cognitive theories about analogical reasoning, like structure mapping, where you need to start off with the right sort of uh, primitives and relations in the two domains, and then you can and then you can map between them. Unless you have that, you can't achieve that mapping. Yeah. So I think you know one one of the mistakes that people make in in contemporary AI research is to is to, is to it's a failure to treat the kinds of computation that underlie sensory motor behaviors and the kinds of computation that underlie you know cognitive behaviors reasoning and 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 inference a failure to treat those differentially and I think those are fundamentally different sorts of problems and I think they're solved in fundamentally different ways in the human brain. I think that, you know, if you look at sensory motor behaviors, you know, it takes years or months, years for us to learn to, to walk and to recognize objects, for example, right? It requires a lot of data. And, you know, it's a highly complex nonlinear problem at the end of which we have, you know, reasonably useful representations, both of objects and of motor patterns, right? But that takes a long time to learn. And I think that, you know, when we look at human cognitive behavior, there's an assumption that the same thing sort of happens, right? That we just use, you know, big, complex function approximation to acquire knowledge about, you know, I don't know, you know, um, how to do uh, legal jurisprudence or how to diagnose illnesses or, you know, how to, um, I don't know, understand um, the pancreas, right? And I just think that that those types of understanding those kind that that rely on structured knowledge are not acquired in the same way that sensory motor behaviors are acquired they're acquired in fundamentally different ways and it's not just through lots of training and lots of feedback and whether that's reinforcement or or supervised it's it's through a fundamentally different process that has much more to do with sort of assembling little packets of knowledge into composite holes, bootstrapping off, you know, existing fragmentary understanding to try to gradually build up the sorts of knowledge bases that allow us to function effectively. And I think computationally, it's a completely, completely different process. Um, and I think that's, 
you know, in, in thinking about, you know, the, the nature of reasoning and thinking about how we solve these types of problems, I think it's really, really important to separate those two domains. So, uh, Sam, the last time you were on the podcast, you recommended the book, What is Thought by Eric Baum. Uh, and in that, I started reading it. Um, the way he thinks of the mind, uh, which is what we all kind of want to understand, uh, or that's an assumption on my part, I, what I want to understand, the way he thinks of a mind is as a collection of, uh, pro well, the mind is a program, and not only is it a program, it's a collection, like all programs are, of subroutines, of subfunctions. And he uh, posits, you know, that most of the, the, the great stuff that we do, of course, is unconscious. And these are all like the tiny sub subroutines working in the background. And I'm hoping that this is related to what, what Chris was just uh, talking about. Uh, and that what the end result of all these subroutines working together somehow, uh, all these modules working together is what results in mind and what we what we think of as mind. But uh, analogical reasoning, for instance, you know, and and the the awareness of coming up with analogy is just kind of this this end result of all these subroutines working uh, in in a massive interaction, and that you know we need to understand how the subroutines or algorithms are combining and being reused for various different cognitive functions, and that's the way to to go about understanding how our higher cognitive functions and our minds uh, come about. And uh, Chris has noted in talks, you know, and especially with in AI, you know, modules like attention being added, um, you know, memory, external memory, those sorts of modules being added. Uh, Chris has noted that one thing he thinks is important moving forward in AI is to figure out how to make all these little modules work together and function together. Uh, and that, that might be key to developing some of these higher cognitive functions that are more human-like, right? Or more powerful anyway. So uh, I, I wanted to throw that out there first of all, but I also wanted to ask if that is a place that is ripe for neuroscience, cognitive science to inform AI, or if that's a place where AI is just going to engineer it. And if, and if you still, if you agree with that Eric Baum, if you still recommend that book, and if you agree with that conception of mind as well, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I think just hearkening back to the thing that Chris said last uh, about these sort of two completely different computational processes for acquiring different kinds of information. On the one hand, sensory motor learning that might rely on some kind of dense function approximation, whereas higher cognition um, is something more modular and um, maybe hierarchical. I don't know if, Chris, I'm, I'm paraphrasing you correctly, mm -hmm. but I, I mean, it, it's maybe, maybe it's a little bit too extreme to say that it's completely different learning mechanism, like, you know, who knows, maybe both of them rely on backprop. But, but I, I do agree that the basis of higher cognition has to do with putting together simple building blocks into um, more complex functions. I think that that is undoubtedly true. And if you want to learn those abilities, you have to have strong inductive biases um, that uh, promote discovery of this kind of modularity and hierarchical composition and so on, right? Um, uh, and those kinds of inductive biases might be fundamentally different than the kinds of inductive biases you need to learn a dense, let's say, feed-forward mapping from sensory to motor uh, programs. But in terms of your question, Paul, about whether we can benefit from studying the brain, I, I guess it just all depends on what exactly one means by that. Um, because, you know, there's just tons of data on things like attention and memory, right? But only some of that data is actually going to be useful from an engineering perspective. And we just, I don't feel like neuroscientists have made a sufficiently precise case about which aspects of the brain and mind are actually useful right. uh, for engineering. So I think that's a, that's a I would guess, a, a reason to have more dialogue at the level of here are these particular things that people do, not just in general, like, complementary learning systems in some very general sense, but actually like, here's how we think computationally comp complementary learning systems or attention works in the brain. Can we leverage those ideas for, for AI? And, and so uh, an, another way of saying that is computational and cognitive neuroscientists are building models all the time of things like attention and memory. But I think from the perspective of the engineers, 
these models are not particularly useful because they're not scalable. Um, and they, and they're designed to ex explain some very specific phenomena as opposed to being some kind of general purpose, uh, tool that can suck in data and, and solve some task that we'd agree is, is, um, useful and interesting. And so there's a kind of disconnect in the, in the methodologies. Um, so, uh, and I'm, I, I, I gather that I think, I think at least people at DeepMind, for example, are, are interested in, in probing this more like, can we take the computational ideas from computational cognitive neuroscience and sort of uh, upgrade them so that they can work in actual intelligent systems? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I completely agree that, you know, there's, that there is a major barrier in translating any of these ideas, whether it's ideas about composition or whether it's ideas about memory systems or attention or whatever, a major barrier in translating from neuroscience to, to AI. And that is, you know, for the, what one barrier, as Sam mentioned, is just scale, right? So we tend to build toy models in neuroscience and everything, you know, in, in machine learning, it's, it's not whether it works that matters, it's whether it scales, right? Or at least, you know, that's, that's at least as, as important. The second issue is that in neuroscience, we tend to focus, you know, we, we, we tend to be narrowly focused. So most people, I mean, I think, you know, Sam's group is really an exception because of the, the breadth of topics which are studied in his, in his lab. Uh, but most groups focus on either one brain area or one method or, you know, one process and they sort of drill down into that and try to understand it. And, you know, of course, that's fine if you just want to model some data, you know, from hippocampal neurons, but it's not fine if you want the whole system to work. Right? And then the last gap is that our models tend to be pretty handcrafted, of course, in neuroscience, right? And so, you know, handcrafted models have relatively limited utility in contemporary machine learning. So all those are serious impediments to, you know, it mean all, all those mean that you can't just take sort of ideas from neuroscience off the shelf and translate them into viable machine learning methods. But I think, you know, I'm sure Sam would agree that the whole point of what we're doing in in cognitive science, in computational neuroscience, is basically to try to come up with like good new ideas that might be seeds that might be, you know, planted and might scale. Not all of them are going to scale, right? But they're just interesting principles about how information processing systems work that give us the nugget of an insight that might one day be translated into something bigger and more powerful. I'm reminded of when my kids were little and you'd get all of this parenting advice. And um, I remember my my parents had particularly strong feelings about various things. And I <laughs> asked them, did you, did you do the same thing um, for my brother? Uh, and they said, sure. And I said, did it work? And they said, no, of course not. He's totally different. <laughs> I said, so why do you think it would work for my kids? And, uh, and my, my wife had the, um, the sage wisdom to point out that like, we shouldn't be thinking about parenting advice as, um, sort of uh, ironclad rules about how things should be done, but just ideas to be tried. So maybe cognitive neuroscience is kind of like the, the naggy parent for, AI, <laughs> um, give it, giving various kinds of, um, rules about how the brain works, but it's up to the engineers to kind of figure out, uh, and to use those suggestions and to figure out what's actually useful. See, I just interviewed Alison Gopnik, who has written a whole book about how parenting is a recent word and, uh, to be a parent is different than parenting and we shouldn't parent or we shouldn't, yeah, we shouldn't parent. It's it's not a real verb. We've only taken it on recently in society as a verb because it doesn't work. So I guess what you're saying is cognitive science doesn't work for AI. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I, I just think I think I, I I like Chris's perspective because I think it's it's more pragmatic. It's saying like we we shouldn't we shouldn't hope that cognitive science and neuroscience are going to give us completely f like fully functional computational principles for artificial intelligence. What they're going to give us are seeds for the construction of engineering systems because it's just any any realistically uh, any, any system that's going to work in the real world is going to require all sorts of um extra stuff that we're not going to get from um these kinds of uh, stylized models that we typically use in cognitive science and neuroscience so in philosophy of mind so there's always there's been this age-old question of whether mental or states are causal, right? So eliminativism uh, says that they aren't, that uh, eventually we will, um, you know, the, the functional states of the, at the implementation level essentially will 
we'll learn enough about them that mental states will figure out uh, are eventually not causal. Do you think that AI will settle that debate, uh, you know, building these networks and and will be able to use, you know, build AI that's explainable enough to us that we can understand enough that that it will settle the debate of whether mental states, quote unquote, are causal or whether it's just all network uh, properties or wh- will that become a moot question? I think the answer to the question is no. <laughs> I don't think anything will ever settle any philosophical debates. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I think the point of those philosophical book debates is not to be settled. It is to they, they are they are tools for the exploration of reason itself and the the entrainment of cognitive processes that surround rhetoric and debate and and their ways of thinking about problems. I don't think that uh, yeah I don't I don't think the point of that debate is to be settled. Maybe, maybe I'm an outlier. Maybe I, uh, philosophers who are listening will just want to shoot me at this point. But I think it's, <laughs> Yeah. Last, last question. Just, just where, um, where did we end up here? So how, so how useful is neuroscience for AI? How, you know, and vice versa, but most of the first question, because that's the question that I think is mostly assumed is that nurse these days is that neuroscience is not very useful for AI. So I don't know, where did we come to? I, I have about a thousand more questions as you guys know, but, uh, we'll, we'll end up with this one. Did we settle anything? I mean, I'm still totally open to us discovering things from neuroscience that'll be useful for AI. I just think that we have to keep in mind that in order to be able to recognize some discovery as being useful in the first place, you need to be able to computationally implement it, right? And you need to be able to recognize the computations in the first place. It's sort of like if I just stumbled upon a Turing machine on the sidewalk and I didn't know anything about Turing machines, would I be able to, you know, understand a Turing machine um, just from, from like handling this artifact, like maybe that's possible in principle, but it would be extremely challenging. Um, and so I think the same is true for neuroscience, maybe even more true that we, we have to just start with a, we have to go into it with computational principles in order to be able to, to recognize anything in the first place. And, and so the, the process of translating from neuroscience to AI is more a process of, um, kind of, as I said, upgrading the discoveries from neuroscience and the models from neuroscience, as opposed to like this sort of naively empiricist mode of discovery where, where we like find some biological phenomenon and plug it into our models. And all of a sudden our models are going to have the, uh, be much more powerful. Chris, I have one, then I have one question for you. I hear the baby crying. It's from the deep learning is the answer paper. So, uh, one of the things that, uh, you guys write about is, you know, using idealistic reduced uh, deep, deep models so that we can conceptually understand what's going on. And this goes back to understanding. Uh, and I'm wondering if, uh, do you think our, our conceptual insight will ever catch up to the complexity of what we can build and use? Will that complexity forever be a couple steps ahead while we're trying to, uh, look at that huge model, reduce it into an answerable question for our understanding. And that's how we advance our understanding. Well, I guess the messy real world is always, you know, ahead of our idealizations of it, right? That's just a general principle. Um, but I mean, those idealizations, I mean, hopefully they're, they're useful for lots of things. I mean, I, wh- one of the, the reasons why I think it's a great time to be a cognitive scientist or a neuroscientist is precisely because there is this reawakened interest in models that kind of learn by themselves, right? So it means that the dynamics of learning, the ways in which we learn, you know, the, the ways we can accelerate learning, the structure in our learning, like all of these are are viable questions in a way that they were not when the state spaces of our models were entirely populated by hand. And that's the the opportunity that, that my lab has tried to seize and um, to study at small scale, but to study for its own sake, right? I mean, these questions, you know, clearly may have resonance one day, probably not in my hands, probably in Sam's hands, but may have resonance for for AI one day. But for me, really, the goal is just to understand the principles of learning. Use use these tools, these networks as tools for understanding principles of learning per se as a research topic. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chris. Uh, We'll see how this turned out, but I really appreciate your time and just the open sort of dialogue here. Thank you. It was fun. It was lots of fun. Thank you, Paul. Sam, really nice to see you. Yeah. We'll catch up soon. All right. Take care.
Brain Inspired is a production of me and you. I don't do advertisements. You can support the show through Patreon for a trifling amount and get access to the full versions of all the episodes, plus bonus episodes that focus more on the cultural side but still have science. Go to braininspired.co and find the red Patreon button there. To get in touch with me, email paul at braininspired.co. The music you hear is by The New Year. Find them at thenewyear.net. Thank you for your support. See you next time.